أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger, the peak of his creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited savior, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in describing himself in the Holy Quran states, Inna Allah azizun dhuntiqam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aziz, almighty, powerful. What other attribute does he have in this verse? Dhuntiqam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeks revenge or Allah disciplines or he seeks retribution. When we read this attribute, this description, we might be puzzled. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. He is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Arham ar rahimin How is it that Allah would seek revenge from anyone? Isn't revenge an emotion that we human beings experience when we have a grudge, when we have hatred? So we seek our vengeance with hatred and grudges. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above these emotions. So how do we understand these attributes that the Holy Quran is describing to us? It is very important for us to come closer to Allah to be familiar with the names and the attributes of Allah. Every attribute of Allah, every name of Allah, reflects an amazing dimension of His existence. That is why the hadith from Imam al-Sadiq states, the one who knows the 99 names of Allah, ahsaha dakhla al-jannah. If you're familiar with these names, not just memorizing them, some people think you just memorize them, free ticket into heaven. You memorize them, you learn them, you study them, you reflect on them, and you even implement them in your life. That will make you successful and that will give you salvation for you to go to Jannah, for you to enter paradise. The beauty of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that in any moment, in any given state, you can take one of Allah's names and connect to that name. And that name will inspire you. That name will give you energy and strength and power and wisdom. For instance, one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Wasi or Musa. This comes from the Arabic word that means vast. That means big, vast. Whenever you feel depressed, just say, Ya Allah, Ya Wasa, Ya Musa. Say to yourself, Allah who expanded this universe, He cannot expand my heart. He cannot expand my chest. So I will be relieved from this difficult state that I am in. Keep saying, Ya Wasa, Ya Musa, several times. You will feel powerful. You will, you will feel relieved. You will feel good. You will feel much better. When you have committed, committed excessive sins and you're almost about to lose hope, which of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should you mention? Ya Sattar, O oh Allah, who, the one who conceals my sins. Ya Ghaffar, O oh the one who excessively forgives me. Connecting to these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important in always keeping you in a proper state. Now one of the attributes of Allah is dhuntiqam. Allah has 
vengeance. Allah has intiqam. How do we understand that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as you already know, does not have emotions. When Allah says in the Quran, I love the good doers, I love the mu'mineen, does that mean that Allah experiences love? Of course not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a physical entity with chemical react reactions in the brain for him to experience emotions the way we do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above emotions. When the Quran tells us that God loves you, it means God will reward you. He'll benefit you. He'll, bring you. He'll give you a high status. So you look at the consequence of the emotion, not the emotion itself. Allah is above emotions. So the Holy Quran tells us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is azizun dun tiqam. Allah has revenge. Allah has intiqam. What does that mean? When we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intiqam, that means Allah disciplines you. And it's based on His wisdom to discipline us. Sometimes Allah will try you because He's coaching you, He's training you. Like a coach, what does a good coach do? A good coach makes him te his team suffer. Believe me, some of those team players, they have very, very difficult training. You and I will not last. We cannot handle that. Non-stop exercise and work set workouts and training sessions. But why does the coach do that? To make his team members suffer? He wants them to succeed and win. He wants to keep them in shape. If he sees a certain weakness in them, he focuses on that weakness. He keeps striking at that weak spot. So they would develop strength. So they work on their weaknesses. When we go through trials in our lives, Allah is our coach. He's training us. He's alerting us to our weaknesses. But sometimes we have to be stopped. Sometimes we have to be disciplined. When Allah sees that I'm transgressing, sin after sin, violation after violation, mistake after mistake, I am wronging other people, sometimes Allah will strike me. It's intiqam, it's revenge. But it's with what purpose? To discipline you. And if you truly love someone, you discipline them. How many of you have grounded your children when they've done very disturbing things? Why? Do you hate your children when you ground them or you confiscate something from them like their iPads? Why do you do that? Because you want to raise them well. You want to discipline them. Allah is our murabbi. He's our coach. He raises us so he disciplines us. That's how we understand such an attribute that Allah has intiqam. Not that he hates us and has a grudge. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is threatening us. I'll discipline you. So he uses language that we use. We all understand what intiqam means. Be careful. Allah is very patient, but sometimes He will strike you to discipline you, to stop the evil, so you can change or to protect others from you. That is a beautiful quality, beautiful attribute that we find in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another dimension of intiqam is the representatives of God. One of the names of Al-Imam Al-Mahdi is Al-Muntaqim. This is one of his names. Imam al-Mahdi seeks revenge. In one authentic hadith, after Imam al-Hussein was killed and martyred in Karbala, the angels of the heavens cried. They were deeply moved by the tragedy of Imam Hussein. They excessively cried on Imam Hussein. And they complained to Allah. They said, Ya Allah, this is your Hussein, the grandson of your prophet. And he is killed like that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a vision for them, an image. They saw the imams of Ahlul Bayt who would come after Imam Hussein. They were all sitting down, the eight, except the last one, he was standing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angels, Do you see the one who is standing? بِذَٰلِكَ الْقَائِمْ أَنْتَقِمُ لَهُ with that one who's standing, the Mahdi, the Qa'im, I shall seek revenge for what happened to Imam Hussein. So that's one of the reasons why Imam al-Mahdi is called the Muntaqim. He will seek revenge from the killers of Imam Hussein, and he will seek vengeance for the death of Imam Hussein. 
الإمام الصادق عليه السلام was asked الإمام الرضا عليه السلام was asked they were asked the Mahdi when he rises who will he seek revenge from the killers of Imam Hussein have been killed or they died they're not here when the Imam is going to reappear so how is it that الإمام المهدي is going to seek revenge from the killers of Imam Hussein that doesn't make any sense Al-Imam al-Sadiq gives us a very moving, powerful response. The Imam salam states, their followers exist at that time who have accepted the injustice to Imam Hussein. They did not reject it. They did not condemn it. So Allah considers them partners in crime. The Mahdi will seek revenge from them. This important Islamic concept is one that we need to reflect on every single day. The Prophet ﷺ, all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt told us, if there's an act of injustice in your society or around the world, and you're okay with it, you don't reject it in your heart, Allah will consider you a partner in crime. Your cousin is oppressed in your family, and you see the injustice every day. Every day, my cousin, my sister, my brother, someone in my family, I know someone, who is being harassed, who is being bullied, who is being abused, and I don't do anything. At school, I see my classmate being bullied. I don't care. I'm okay with it. Allah considers me a criminal. Ya Allah, I didn't do the crime. I didn't do the bullying. Yes, you were okay with it. You didn't show a stance. Allah will consider you a criminal. And the same goes with good deeds in the opposite scenario. Whenever... Any act of goodness happens and you're okay with it, you love it, you like it, Allah will give you the reward of that good deed. Once, according to Nahj al balagha Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, after Allah gave him victory at the battle of Jamal, one of the companions of Imam Ali, he said, I wish my brother was here who died. I wish he was here today to see this. The Imam Ali salam told, asked him the follow-up question. He told him, your brother, did he have the same faith you have? Was he on this path? He said, yes, he was on this path. The Imam السلام, told him, he is with us. He told him, what do you mean he's with us? The Imam told him, every human being, whether those in the past or those who will come in the future, anytime they accept an act of goodness, anytime they wish they were with the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the reward of being with us. Your brother, his spiritual presence is with us. And Allah has given him the reward of fighting with us to defend the truth. Imagine the reward you get by accepting acts of goodness. And hence, Imam al-Rada salam says to Ibn Shabib, when he tells him about Imam Hussein and the significance of mourning for Imam Hussein, he tells him, Yabna Shabib if you wish to be with the companions of Aba Abdullah. And if you wish to have their reward, from the bottom of your heart say, Ya laytana kunna ma'akum fanafuza fawzan azima. Say, I wish, Ya Allah, I were with the companions of Imam Hussein. So I would achieve a grand victory. The Imam says, if you say that and you mean it, Allah will give you the reward of fighting with Imam Hussein. And so if you want a massive reward on the day of judgment, say to Allah, Ya Allah, every act of goodness that has happened in history with the prophets of God, with the imams, I accept it, I support it, I love it, I advocate for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you all these free hasanat. See, Allah loves a good knee. The most thing Allah loves you for is your intention. Allah loves good intentions. Be good, be positive, have good intentions. When you have good intentions, you turn out to be an amazing human being. And reject bad intentions, reject batil, reject falsehood. There are people who accept injustice. There are people today who claim to be Muslims. Believe me, they're okay with the killing of Imam Hussein. I've seen them. On the day of Ashura, they pass sweets, they congratulate one another. They don't care. It's not like anything happened on this day. Who cares? The grandson of the Prophet was killed. Okay, who cares? This was a thousand years ago. Machasni, it's not my problem. Okay. Let you or your children or your 
followers deal with an Imam al-Mahdi when he's the muntaqim. You know what the slogan is of the followers of Imam al-Mahdi, his companions? Ya litharat al Hussein. That is their banner. The vengeance for killing Imam al Hussein. Anyone who accepts injustice, the Imam al Mahdi will confront him. Reject injustice, or you will be confronted. So that is why he's the muntaqim. Because there are people who accept evil in history. Allah wants a mu'min not to have any negative intentions in their heart. This is one way in which the Mahdi is the muntaqim. The second way is a lot more interesting. The second way is practical vengeance. The enemies of Imam Hussein, what did they want? What was their goal? To stop justice. What is the problem that they had with Imam Hussein? Did Imam Hussein steal their money? No. Did he kill any of their family members? No. There wasn't anything personal. Imam Hussein said no to injustice. I will not pledge allegiance to a dictator like Yazid, to an evil ruler like Yazid. They despised him for his justice, for his goodness. The best revenge from the enemies of Imam Hussein is to establish justice on earth and to continue the mission of Imam Hussein. That is called practical intiqam, practical vengeance. And that is the most beautiful way Imam al-Mahdi will be the muntaqim. The enemies of Imam Hussein stopped him from, establish just, from establishing justice on earth. Al-Mahdi will continue the mission of justice on earth. By establishing justice, he's seeking revenge from the enemies. Because their mission was to stop justice, he will continue justice. This is practical vengeance. That is why psychologists, scientists, rational people tell you, if you have someone who's wronged you in society, who hates you, who wants you to fail, who's wronged you in so many ways, the best revenge you can seek from that person is what? Go knock down their house? No. Go create problems for them? No. What's the best revenge you can take? Be more successful. The best revenge you take from your enemies is to stay successful and to be more successful because they cannot stand your success. That's why they hate you. Become more successful. This is called practical vengeance. And that's how a mu'min operates. If a mu'min realizes he has enemies out there, he doesn't waste his time running after them, seeking revenge from them. He doesn't waste his time. He uses his time to improve himself and become more successful. That is practical vengeance. And this is the type of vengeance that Imam al-Mahdi, Ajallahu ta'ala farajah, will establish and implement. The third way of understanding this, we believe in partial resurrection, which is called the raj'ah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Naml, verse 83, Allah talks about a group of people before the day of judgment. They are evil, Allah will resurrect them. وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُ مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فَوْجًا مِمَّنْ يُكَذِّبُ بِآيَاتِنَا فَهُمْ يُوزَعُونَ Allah says one day before the day of judgment because verse 87 speaks about the day of judgment. In verse 87, Allah says, and when the day of judgment starts, it starts with the trumpet being blown into. In verse 83, Allah states from every nation, there will be a group of people who will be resurrected. But they are evil ones. They reject our signs. Allah says, I will resurrect them. And that is in the raj'ah. And according to our narrations, Allah will resurrect the killers of Imam Hussein. Imam al-Mahdi will administer the punishment on them. This is well established in our hadith. This is called the partial resurrection before the day of judgment. And this is the Quranic evidence of partial resurrection before the day of judgment. Surah An-Naml, verse 83. Now when it comes to us, my dear brothers and sisters, our daily lives and how we live, what role should vengeance and intiqam have? I know some of us, when we get violated, we have this burst of energy to seek revenge. And have you seen some people when they want to seek revenge? They do 10 times more. The person wronged you this much, you retaliate and seek vengeance by destroying this person's life. And we make it a point to seek vengeance because we think that vengeance is sweet. We think vengeance feels good. 
When I seek revenge, I feel good. What do scientific studies show? Do you think that after you seek your revenge, you'll feel better or worse? There was one very interesting study in which scientists wanted to see people who seek revenge, do they feel better or worse? So they got a group of people with four players. They told them we're going to play a game. Now they didn't know that they were being tested, experimented with. They told them let's play a game. We'll give each one of you a dollar. Now there's two things that you can do. Either you put your dollar in a shared plate or cup. It's a pot. You put it in a pot. And when you put those dollars in that pot, each one will receive a dividend. You'll get some money from this investment. So if everyone puts their dollar, they see how much we have in the pot, 40% as a dividend will be split amongst the group. Now you don't have to put the dollar. No one knows what, what's happening in the beginning. You could keep the dollar or put it. Now it's in the interest of the group for everyone to put their dollar. Because if everyone puts their dollar, you have $4. Now you have the maximum amount of dividends on that. So they will share it equally. But some of them might be enticed to do what? Let me keep the dollar. I'll keep my dollar. They'll put $3. And then I'll get a share of their dividend as well. That way I'll have more money than them. It's enticing. It's an experiment. They wanted to study human psychology. So out of this group of four people, one of them was working for the research team. So he kept the dollar. The other guys, they were nice. Everyone put their dollar in order to treat each other equally and make an equal amount of money. This person kept the dollar. Now, when the game was over, they realized that they didn't get as much as they expected. So he admitted. He told them, I kept the dollar. I made more money. So he kind of cheated on them. He betrayed them. Morally, he betrayed them. Now, here's the fun part. The researchers came. And they told them, let's do the following step right now. You can seek revenge from this person by reducing his earnings. Let's punish him. Or you can choose to forgive him. Some of them chose to forgive. Some of them chose to punish. Ten minutes later, they asked them to reflect on their feelings, how they felt. Those who forgave 10 minutes later, they felt more at peace. Those who punished and sought revenge and decreased the earnings of the one who betrayed them, they felt worse. And they couldn't move on. They kept thinking about it. This person cheated on me. I sought revenge. They were stuck in those thoughts. They kept ruminating about it. They did not feel as good. So the research clearly demonstrated that when you seek your revenge, many times you will not feel better. Don't think that by seeking revenge and ruining this person's life, you're going to feel better. That is not the case. You will actually feel worse and you will have a more difficult time moving on. That's why a true believer is one who forgives. When it comes to personal issues, forgive. In one beautiful hadith, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he states, The worst action someone who's able can do is to seek revenge. When you have the power to seek revenge and you, stay, you say no, you're worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam says it's very inappropriate for you to seek revenge when you have the power to do so. In another hadith, Al-Imam al-Sadiq salam or Al-Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib also in a similar hadith. The Imam Ali salam states, when you seek your revenge, you lose the reward in dunya and on the day of judgment. Allah says, I don't give you any reward anymore. You went, you sought your revenge, you destroyed that person. Why should I give you a reward? You already defended yourself. And Imam al-Sadiq salam he says, he quotes the Torah. He says, Allah revealed in the Torah, Abdi, my servant, if you accept that I defend you, it's, mutter, it's much better than for you to defend yourself. 
Accept me defending you. I'll take care of you. Don't go and try to always cause problems with people trying to seek revenge. I'll take care of you. Someone said something negative about you, let it slide. It's okay. I've seen some people in some communities, if they hear the least comment or criticism against them, believe me, it's the day of judgment. They will cause fights, problems, family, families break up, friendships are destroyed. It's okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend you. Don't worry about that. Don't seek your revenge. Yes, we do get upset naturally. We feel upset. But at the same time, realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will defend you. So when it comes to personal matters, don't seek revenge. When it comes to justice, yes. If there is a violator who's causing harm to the people, Islam says stop this person. Seek revenge from the offender. You have to maintain the security of your society, the security of your well-being, of your, of your, the well-being of your community. That is a different issue. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about, you know, qisas, retribution, retribution exists in all religions of Allah. There's no religion that says if someone comes and he blinds you, he should be forgiven all the time. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Torah. Inna anzalna Torah tafiha hudan wa nur. Allah says we've revealed the Torah. There's guidance and light in it. In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, we revealed in the Torah, anna nafsa bin nafs, wal ayna bil ayn, wal anfa bil anf. Allah revealed in the Torah that if a person kills unjustly a murderer in certain conditions, it's acceptable to administer the death, the, the, the death penalty, capital punishment. A person comes and he blinds another person. Vengeance can be sought over here. Why? Why is it when it comes to these security issues, Allah has allowed intiqam? Why? Deterrence to protect you. Allah states, وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاصِ حَيَاتٌ يَا أُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ Through retribution, Allah gives you life. If a criminal knows that if you go, you kill this person, you amputate the arm of this person, you blind this person, the same will happen to you. Most criminals will stop. When does a criminal continue? When he thinks he can get away with it. Let me go ruin this person's life and then yalla, I'll get a good lawyer, pay him a million dollars, he'll get me out. I'll serve a few years and then I'll be out. You know, the way the modern prison system and justice system works is not that effective. Many, many researchers are saying this, especially in the United States. It's not really that effective. Yes, today some people, they tell you, I cannot stand the Islamic justice system. Remember, the Islamic justice system has conditions. It must be a just government. People know right from wrong. You have a government who's serving the people, not stealing from, from the people. What you find in some Muslim countries, the government itself, if you want to establish Islamic law, the first people you have to punish is the government. They're the biggest thieves. SubhanAllah, they go and they bring a poor guy who's stolen and they cut his hand and they are the biggest thieves. That's unjust. You really want to implement the law of Allah? Start with yourself. You're stealing the resources of the nation. So that's why some non-Muslims, they're critical of Sharia. They tell you Sharia is violent. It's not implemented properly. If it's implemented properly with conditions, it brings you peace and security in society. So at the personal level, Islam says forgive, don't seek revenge. But at the community level, no, you need to keep your community safe. And so repeated offenders, you have to stop them. Allah has revealed this before the Quran in the Torah. An eye for an eye. This is in the Bible, in the Old Testament. Now, the final point over here, when we speak about vengeance and intiqam, and as we are approaching the end of the month of Ramadan, and we want to see how we can proceed till the next year, staying strong and purifying our nafs. There is one being that you should always seek revenge from. Who is that? Any ideas? Your nafs, yourself. If you want to be successful, seek revenge from your nafs. 
the day you realize your nafs is greedy, it's asking too much, it's pushing you towards haram, pushing you towards sins, pushing you towards violations, seek revenge from your nafs. That's how you tame it and discipline it. Let's say your nafs pushed you to do something haram. Punish your nafs. Say, I will seek revenge from my nafs al-ammara, from my evil inciting soul, by sacrificing a pleasure for a month. Sacrifice something for a month that you really like. There's a food that you like to eat. No pizza for an entire month. Believe me, this works, especially the youth. If you want to keep yourself in check, seek revenge from your nafs. For an entire month, I will not eat this food. To demonstrate to my nafs that if you do it again, I'll make it two months next time. You have to threaten your nafs. Next time, I'm going to cheat my business partner. I'm going to give up these joys of life for three months. You have to challenge your nafs. When you challenge your nafs and you discipline your nafs, you begin to purify your nafs. And that's mukhalifat al-hawa. This is what the Holy Quran tells us to do, especially in the month of Ramadan. Why do you fast? You know, when you fast and you deny yourself pleasures during the day, that is a type of self-intiqam. That's a type of seeking revenge from the nafs. You're telling your nafs, look, behave. I'm denying you food and water and pleasures, so you behave, so you don't become greedy. So I control you, not you controlling me. That's why fasting is extremely powerful in keeping us in check. Even throughout the year, even after the month of Ramadan, if you struggle with desires, you struggle with a weak willpower, fast. Fasting gives you a stronger willpower. Seeking revenge from the nafs is a very powerful tool to always keep us in check. Always resist that nafs. This is the lesson that we conclude with in the month of Ramadan. Going forward, now I have the power. After fasting for almost a month, I have the power to say no and discipline your nafs. If you have obligations and you're oversleeping, you know, sometimes we sleep in, yalla. let me sleep 10 hours today, 12 hours today. Your nafs is greedy. Today you sleep 12 hours, tomorrow your nafs says, I want more, give me 13 hours. Say no to the nafs. Say to your nafs, next time you waste time like that, I'm going to seek revenge from you. I'll sleep three hours. Challenge your nafs. Let your nafs know that it's not comfortable to do whatever it wants. There's a guard. There's a police who's going to find the nafs, discipline the nafs. That's how believers, by the way, you might find this silly, but this is effective. This is how believers tame themselves through this self-discipline. And so this is one very important aspect of our lives as we conclude the month of Ramadan that we pay attention to, my dear brothers and sisters, to end with self-discipline. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that power and that energy and the inner vision to truly purify this nafs. The month of Ramadan is all about purification of the nafs. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our souls and to purify our nafs in what remains from the month of Ramadan.